Hallo und herzlich willkommen an all jene, die es hier mit uns gemeinsam in diesen Online-Raum, den Zoom-Raum geschafft haben, diesen Termin mitbekommen haben zu unserem Talk hier zu Spyware, äh, zum Tag der Pressefreiheit, den wir heute haben. Der Titel ist ausgespäht, wie der Einsatz von Spyware gegen JournalistInnen unsere Demokratie gefährdet. Ein Thema, das sicherlich nicht ganz oben auf der Aufmerksamkeitstabelle gerade steht bei all den Krisen und auch natürlich aktuellen Debatten, die wir an allen Stellen innenpolitisch, europapolitisch, international haben, ist dieser Skandal, der die Tatsache, dass also Spyware gegen JournalistInnen auch in Demokratien eingesetzt wird, ein bisschen oder ziemlich deutlich in den Hintergrund gerückt. Und trotzdem äh, ist es eben auch unsere Aufgabe hier als Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung, gerade diese Themen, die eben auch abseits der Anlassaufmerksamkeit von grundlegender Bedeutung sind, äh, zu thematisieren. Und was ist dafür besser geeignet, eben diesen Tag der Pressefreiheit, den internationalen Tag der Pressefreiheit auch zu nutzen, um darüber zu sprechen, wie es um ein solches Thema steht. Das Thema ist hochbrisant. Es ist vielen auch sicherlich immer wieder zur Kenntnis gekommen. Es hat einen Einsatz von Spyware an verschiedenen Stellen gegenüber JournalistInnen gegeben. Und es gibt dazu äh, eine ganze Reihe von Personen, die dem nachgehen aus unterschiedlichen äh, Perspektiven und mit unterschiedlichen Rollen. Wir wollen heute hier mit drei Gästen über das Thema reden. Und ähm, diese möchte ich eingangs einmal vorstellen. Das ist einerseits ähm, eine Person, die 2017 ein Netzwerk von JournalistInnen gegründet hat, das es sich zum Ziel gesetzt hat, Recherchen von ermordeten, inhaftierten oder bedrohten ReporterInnen fortzusetzen. Für die umfassende Recherche zu Spyware Pegasus, The Pegasus Project, erhielt er den Reporter ohne Grenzen Impact Prize, und 2018 wurde er mit dem Pri Europa in Berlin zum Europäischen Journalisten des Jahres gewählt. Und er ist Co-Autor des Buches Pegasus, How Spy in Your Pocket Threatens the End of Privacy, uh, Dignity and Democracy, das im Januar 2023 erschienen ist. A warm welcome to you, Laurent Richard. Uh, an der Stelle vielleicht ein kurzer Hinweis, bevor ich die beiden weiteren Teilnehmenden uh, Vorstelle. Wir haben diese Veranstaltung mit Simultanübersetzung äh, versehen. Ähm, das heißt, äh, jeder, der hier auf Englisch zuhören will, kann oder auf Deutsch, je nachdem, wir werden später viel Englisch sprechen, kann mit dem Weltball unten bei Dolmetschen ähm, einstellen, auf welchem Kanal, äh, Kanal sie oder er zuhören möchte. Das äh, sollte also auf jeden Fall dann auch getan werden, damit man der Veranstaltung folgen kann. Und ich sage es auch gleich auf Englisch. So warm welcome to you, Laurent. And I just uh, tell everybody that this, this event is uh, interpreted uh, into German and into English, and you can choose the respective language with this uh, net ball, which you will find uh, in your menu of the Zoom. And you should do that to follow our talk, uh, because in the beginning, I'm talking a little bit German. Later on, we will have to talk in English. Also, uh, unser zweiter Gast äh, unter anderem muss man, äh, ist unter anderem, muss man sagen, Friedens- und Menschenrechtspolitische Sprecherin der Fraktion Bündnis 90 oder die Grünen, Europäische Freie, Freie Allianz im Europäischen Parlament, Vizevorsitzende des Menschenrechtsausschusses im Europäischen Parlament und Mitglied im Ausschuss für Sicherheits- und Verteidigungspolitik und, und das ist hier das Besondere, auch im Untersuchungsausschuss äh, zu dem Pegasus-Skandal, der also hier auch ein zentrales Thema ist. Als Expertin zu diesem Untersuchungsausschuss ist sie heute da. Schön, dass du da bist, Hanna Neumann. Und unser dritter Gast ist jemand, der Speak the Truth to Power ein Stück weit verkörpert, also die Wahrheit ans Licht bringen, auch wenn es den Mächtigen nicht passt. Als investigativer Journalist hat er zum Beispiel bereits 2008 die Bestechungszahlungen von Siemens in Griechenland aufgedeckt. Als Co-Autor der Recherche Fly, Fight the 
A flight of the Predator jet uh, linked to Israeli spyware tycoon delivers surveillance tech from the EU to notorious Sudanese militia, militia in der er uh, die Predator-Affäre und internationale Verstrickungen unter anderem im Sudan im Detail schildert, wurde er 2023 für den European Press Prize nominiert und er selbst wurde auch schon ausspioniert. Herzlich willkommen, Tassos Tiloglu den wir jetzt dann auch gleich sehen sollten. Er macht bestimmt gleich seine Kamera an. Ähm, jetzt steigen wir in die Diskussion ein. Wie gesagt, ich werde in dieser Diskussion jetzt die Fragen auf Englisch stellen und es wird auch auf Englisch geantwortet, aber es gibt die Übersetzung äh, hier direkt im, äh, im Talk sozusagen. I'm starting with Laurent, with you, Laurent. Um, Maybe we just start with a very general question about how the case of spyware against journalists um, uh, in your Pegasus pro project research um, uh, is, um, uh, yeah, is taking place and who was being spied on in this case and on whom, um, how did you find out and what were the consequences? So could you tell us a bit more on the Pegasus project uh, in general so we get into the subject? Sure, absolutely, I can do that. And, and thank you for having me. I'm very uh, thrilled to be with you and Anna and all the panelists uh, today on, on that World Press Freedom Day to Uh, to speak about um, yeah the Pegasus project, we're almost one year and a half after the revelation, and it's interesting to discuss what what are currently the the outcome of that. But uh, just be, beginning at the um, uh, from the from the start, all all of this start with uh, um, um, the access of a, of a, of a leak, uh, and on that leak we were having access to fifty um, thousand uh, phone numbers of um, in different kind of countries uh, of people potentially targeted by Pegasus. And Pegasus is the name of a, of a spy war sold by a company called uh, the NSO Group. This is an Israeli-based company. And, uh, and, and we were both at Forbidden Stories and at Amnesty International Security Lab granted access to that leak. And, and that leak was really... Um, Uh, historical because we, for the very first time, we we had a kind of uh, view knowledge uh, about who was uh, spied on spied on all over the world and 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 who were the faces, who were the people targeted by 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 that kind of spy work, and and we were able to to find who were behind, behind those numbers and many journalists were there, many dissidents, many political opponents. Uh, many many people were sharing the same thing. Uh, they were challenging the power, and and some of them were uh, yeah some dissidents were uh, from Morocco, and then now they are living in France. Other ones are journalists in Azerbaijan. Uh, other ones are journalists based in France and were targeted by by different kind of countries. Um, Mexico was one of the um, large customer of the NSO group as well. So many people were targeted in the country. So, so this is how we discover, to answer your question, many, not only journalists, but many other people who were not terrorists, who were not criminals, who were not supposed to be on that list, who were not supposed to be targeted. And we're not supposed to be targeted with a military weapon because this is what Pegasus is. This is a, a weapon uh, designed and sold by, by a company that is exporting uh, with a military license as uh, um, a weapon that is used officially to catch the terrorists, to catch the criminals. But in reality, as nobody is controlling that, uh, in reality, those customers of the NSO group are using that uh, as they want, as they want it. And so this is what we were able to, to, to reveal. Thank you. Um, I mean, these revelations, of course, um, and, and all the research being done by, by you and your colleagues uh, also led to the um, situation that the European Parliament started to investigate on uh, the possible spying on people who should absolutely not be on those lists and um, who were uh, doing like absolutely legitimate uh, uh, work. Um, 
And uh, Hannah, you ha have been now part of this Pegasus um, uh, uh, committee, the Pega committee, and uh, there have been uh, lots of meetings uh, since uh, it has started its work in April 22. And um, uh, in this year, which you, I think, met about 26 times, uh, what can you summarize uh, uh, as, a, like, uh, as a result of what happened in these meetings? And what can we expect also um, uh, to be the way ahead uh, after this committee's work? Thank you, Jan, for having me. And I'm very glad to speak with between these two uh, formidable speakers, we were aware as members of parliament, especially those working in the human rights committee about the misuse of spyware, especially by some dictators in the Middle East, already before these major revelations of the 50,000 list. But it was exactly the work of Citizens Lab of Forbidden Stories of Tassos and others um, that made my colleagues understand that this is not just something, the misuse of spyware, something happening in dictatorships elsewhere, but is actually happening in the middle of the European Union. And when we started the debate in the parliament, it was in Hungary and Poland that we saw spyware not just being used against organized crime or in the case of terrorism, but deliberately as a tool to investigate on journalists, but also to investigate on what to spy on opposition politicians, for example, or so on lawyers. And later on, we had revelations in Spain. We had revelations in Greece. Um, we also see how some other countries are involved, for example, in the export, in the problematic export, such as the one in Sudan. And this prompted the European Parliament really to wake up. And we found out in the course of our work, actually, that at least four members of the European Parliament were spied upon. Um, so it clearly infringes all level of democracy. And we have done all these hearings, as you said, Jan, and we have also done missions um, to a number of countries, those that I just named, but also Israel, for example, um, trying to investigate and to get more information. And maybe the first finding is all European Union member states blocked. So the report on which we will vote, by the way, on Monday, um, so we are quite timely with our discussion today, um, is based on the work of Citizens Lab, of Amnesty Tech, if, of Forbidden Stories and others. It is not based on inv information that we receive from the member states because they are blocking and the commission to say the least is not very helpful. But the information is good enough to clearly establish that we have a huge problem inside the European Union with the misuse of spyware. And it's really systemic. We have a problem that the legal processes are not working. We have a problem that victims don't get information, don't get redress. Um, we have a problem that information are not shared with us at the European level, so there's no control structure. And that is why I would say the key demand in our report is that member states have to prove until the end of this year that they can actually use spyware in line with all the legal norms and standards that are out there. Clearly saying it can't be used on, well, on, on, on judges, it can't be used on journalists and so on. Clearly institutionalizing legal processes that has to be behind and clearly saying victims need to have a right to information and to redress. And if member states are not able to do that by the end of this year, they are not no longer allowed to use spyware. We are also discuss discussing a ban, for example, on certain um, functionalities of spyware. We can go into depth in that later. So now we will vote on this on Monday in the committee. Then it goes to plenary. And then, and Jan, you know that better than me, it's a European Parliament's report. So the Parliament is making a lot of recommendations. It's also stating a lot of facts, but it does not necessarily mean, like in a national context, that then all member states will have to follow, or even only the Commission will have to follow. So then kind of the next level of work starts, um, convincing the Commission that they have to start a process where they're really going to put that into law, basically, what we in the European Parliament decided upon. For this to happen, it is quite important that we have a broad majority in Parliament. Uh, I'm confident, but let's see what well the time until summer brings. 
Thank you, Hannah, and also for your work and, and uh, those, uh, um, this work of, of all your colleagues um, uh, on the issue, which uh, has been uh, so important. Uh, and in the end, as you said, um, it's obviously often uh, the member states claiming national security as their competence, uh, but um, uh, we also uh, talk but about- But it's fundamental rights. We have a battle on that and we may win. <laughs> Exactly. We also talk about the fundamental values uh, which are at stake here and even maybe uh, national security, which uh, maybe leads us also to the case which you uh, mentioned, uh, where in Greece, um, the uh, Pegasus uh, uh, surveillance was taking a really uh, heavy example and uh, where if you uh, get into it, uh, really become uh, the idea that uh, we uh, that democracy and, and also uh, national security interests are at stake uh, with uh, what has been done. And I'd like to invite you, Tassos, who uh, has been uh, in the research of all these um, uh, events, uh, especially in uh, Greece, um, uh, and ask you, uh, how did that play out? Where, where did it go in Greece? Could you uh, line out a bit to us uh, what this example means? Well, it, everything started in August 2019, uh, when uh, a month after the change of the government, uh, the government uh, um, came closer to a, a Cypriot-based Israeli company uh, that was controlled by Tal Dillian, a former um, officer of the famous Unit 81 of the Israeli army. This was the electronic war uh, unit. Uh, Dillian has uh, purchased in that uh, time, before 2019, the North Macedonian company Cytrox that used to construct, to design and construct, uh, let's say, a, a Pegasus for the poor, which is called Predator. Uh, the difference between Predator and Pegasus is that uh, in, uh, Pegasus is a zero-click software, but so you don't need to click on a link, but Predator is a, a, a software where you need to click on a link. So they go to a company that sells massive SMSs and they send 50, 100 SMSs with a, a very nice constructed, it's make all by, by social engineering, constructed uh, uh, items in the link that may interest you and bingo, your phone is away. So uh, they take everything. They take your archives, they take your photos, they take your messages, even if they are encrypted. They transform the microphone into something that uh, listens to everything you are saying and uh, your camera in something that's absorbing all the images around your life. So more or less, that's, that's the function of, of Predator. Predator is much cheaper than Pegasus. When NSO proposed to the Greek government to get uh, Pegasus, it was 50 million euros for five years. The Israelis proposed then to give a credit to the Greek government to buy that. Uh, it's everything included, troubleshooting, maintaining, education, etc. While uh, you can buy Predator with 7 million, uh, you have a limitation uh, in targets. You can target maybe uh, 10 people for 160,000 euros a month you can roll all this 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 persons all the time so if uh, hannah goes on vacation they can take their link and target me at this time and when she comes back from vacation then they take they can take the link again if i don't say anything interesting and target hannah again so they work like that and and uh, the, uh, when this happened it happened let's say outsourced from the greek secret service it happened with companies working for the Greek Secret Service, whereas uh, close associates to the then head of the prime minister administrator, uh, chief administrator, have bought 35% of Intellexa, which was the company uh, that was trading with the software. Intellexa belongs to Tal Dillian. Tal Dillian controls Intellexa, but he controlled only 65% of the company, and 35% was controlled by those associates of the uh, uh, head of the prime minister's administration. So it was a public-private partnership in Greece, which is unique. Uh, um, 
and uh, this gave the flexibility to the government to uh, uh, strengthen the deniability arguments after they were discovered. It was not us, it was private people. But uh, these private people, the problem with those private people is that, uh, with these subcontractors, is that they keep their mouth, mouth shut as long as they are not targeted in public. When, they be, when we started targeting them in public, then they started talking. And uh, one of, of the problems of, that Intellexa has is that Intellexa doesn't produce anything by itself. It has a lot, dozens of subcontractors. So these subcontractors were talking all the time because they didn't want to get messed up uh, in this situation. And that's how the Greek spyware uh, scandal erupted. It uh, has uh, led to the resignation of the head of the prime minister's uh, administration uh, in August and the chief of the secret service by August the 4th when it was revealed that the head of the third biggest party in Greece, uh, Mr. Nikos Androulakis, was uh, also targeted with Predator after my colleague Thanasis Koukakis, who is the first European uh, target with Predator. Uh, and uh, this was revealed by the Citizens Lab on March 28, 2022. So until now, we have seen more or less uh, dozens of phones infected by Predator. Uh, we have three cases which are um, uh, investigated by the citizens lab that we have also other cases by people who don't want to go public and this is more or less the situation now I, I would uh, like to add a few things Greece became an export center for the predator not only in Sudan but also in other countries of the Middle East and uh, we're going uh, in the next days to publish on time for the report in Brussels details on the full scale of the Greek exports of this kind of items uh, the previous years. Thank you, Tassos. Uh, I mean, uh, this is being revealed to, to the hard work of journalists and um, press freedom uh, and the, the strengths of also press in Greece has shown that uh, this is possible. On the other side, uh, let me ask you, how do you put this together with the bigger picture uh, of press freedom in Greece then? How do you, um, how do you uh, uh, assess the situation for the press in Greece inside of uh, these developments? Well, as you may know, we had a... Uh, a 10 years uh, hard austerity programs that led also to a weakening of the traditional press outlets. Uh, the press became more uh, um, dependent on big banks and via the banks uh, to the government. The, the government used to possess a lot of those banks in the um, uh, wave of uh, the austerity programs. So, uh, we have media that are weaker because of the austerity programs and because of a, that a very big chunk of revenues uh, goes directly to, to Alphabet and to, to Meta. That means we have 70 to 80 percent of the revenues of 2010 going, going to Alphabet and, and Meta, plus the fact that there is there are indebted the, the media, so they are they are much more weak vis-a-vis uh, -vis government's pressures, pressure. Uh, and we have a lot of small, smaller uh, media outlets that have been founded in the last, let's say, five, six years, which are more or less digital uh, outlets, like the one I work for, my Inside Story, which have uh, an independency uh, to, to where are independent, they have the, the, the capability of addressing that issues. But we're still small, we cannot define uh, the public uh, debate. Uh, and I can tell you that if the government didn't ha hasn't made a mistake to target Mr. Andrulakis, we, have, we would never been able uh, to address a national public like we did after August. 
Thank you. Um, maybe referring back to uh, Laurent, I mean, uh, you have um, since uh, also had the forbidden stories revelations in in uh, yeah in, in a bigger extent. So uh, until today, where are we now with the project? And um, in July uh, 2021. Uh, the, the Pegasus scandal was exposed, uh, the Forbidden Stories Network had coordinated the work and they had found out uh, this worldwide development. And how do you follow up to that now with your uh, Forbidden Stories uh, project? Yeah, so we, we were publishing that with all the partners of Forbidden Stories on, on July 21, as you say. And, and so we were uh, in... So on, on one end, you were having a lot of reaction uh, from the US, for instance, who decided to blacklist the NSO group, making sure that uh, it was it would be no longer possible for any American-based entities to sign a contract with the NSO group. Uh, you were having uh, many reaction uh, all over the world. In, but in the meantime, we're, we were a bit surprised by how some countries, including France and other country members of the EU, were very shy regarding the subject, very uh, reluctant to talk about that. And we didn't understand at the beginning why. And finally, we we tried to we, we, we start to get it and to understand it when we learned that actually many members of the EU uh, were the customers of the NSO group and were using Pegasus. And uh, and and actually, even the the CEO of the uh, the former CEO of NSO was claiming all around him that uh, uh, most of his business were coming from the EU member states, and he was not uh, wrong on that actually. So this, um, um, of course, maybe in 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 Germany, the the use of the Pegasus spyware were much more controlled, uh, I guess, and I suspect from compared to Azerbaijan or Morocco. But but that could explain how the EU were not uh, very um, 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 yeah very okay to provide to Anna and the committee documents information regarding the use of the spyware because they were very embarrassed by that. Then there is um, what what was I think quite impactful as well that uh, that's one reaction coming from the Silicon Valley from the company Apple. And Apple did, before the Pegasus project revelation, Apple was as well a bit shy and, and reluctant to talk about security. Uh, and after the revelation, basically they decided to change their strategy. So they not only decided to sue the NSO group, but they, uh, they decide to notify every single victims of the spy war all around the world. And by doing that, we were then able to track and to discover new victims and new customers of the NS group all around the planet. So that was a very interesting uh, outcome. And, and I think that there is a, a lot that we can and we should expect from our political leaders about providing and building regulation to protect the citizens and to regulate this uh, uh, this uh, unregulated industry, but I, I think as well the companies on the on the, on the industry telecommunication industry side, there is a lot to do because they have the money, they have so they have the power, so they have the power to make sure that their customers that who are using iPhone or other device will be uh, will be able to communicate in a very uh, very safe channels, but um, yeah then. Uh, talking about the country where I'm living, where I'm based, it's uh, where I, I'm, I'm French, and I, I was personally very surprised as well by the lack of reaction from the French government. We were talking about one entire government who were on the list. Uh, we were sure that at least four or five ministers, members of that government, were really infected. And we even find the phone number of the president, Emmanuel Macron himself. And um, despite that level of revelation, the reaction from the French authorities was quite disappointed. Uh, we were talking about 
a, a big, large risk for democracies. This is what uh, this um, um, this uh, issue is about. Uh, when you are spying on a journalist, you try to kill the story. When you are spying on a dissident, you try to kill all these efforts to protect or to build democracy. So the global democracy is very at risk here. And, and I think this is really what, uh, what we are missing here. We, uh, I think uh, on the public opinion, on our leaders, they don't have really, they don't really get the sense or the idea of how uh, first being a victim of a Pegasus spy war is really being a victim. We're talking about a weapon used against civilians. And when you are infected, your ch your, your life with, will entirely change. You know that people who, uh, who are your enemies, who are tracking you, got some information and might be able to use this information against, uh, against you. So this kind of attack, whether it's cyber or not, a cyber attack is creating a lot of trauma. And uh, and the cyber attack like that, when it's at that scale, when we talk, we were talking about fifty thousand phone numbers, is a global threat for democracies. So this is this is why the reaction from political leaders, executive leaders at uh, from French government or the German government or other authorities from the EU were quite disappointed and maybe not at the level that we should expect them when it's about fundamental rights. And um, and yeah, so there is many. So a few a few maybe four weeks uh, earlier, four weeks ago, there were uh, eleven governments, including um, uh, the, the French government, uh, starting with the U.S., who were um, announcing that for now it, it will be not possible anymore to use for those eleven countries to use a commercial spyware that have been known to use to be used again uh, human rights uh, activists who have been known to violate human rights so so this is just a declaration so far so i I'm, I'm not sure how that might change uh, the the game uh, talking about the game i can tell you that even just today in germany in berlin the the, the company the nso group is part of uh, of the of the police congress in germany now and they have a big stand and people are visiting them and so this industry is, is still there there is so many money to make and so and it's not even the, the case or the problem of the nso group it's uh, even if an nso is disappearing you will have 50 other NSO resurfacing. And this is what is happening now. We know from many sources that all the companies were getting the customers were disappointed by NSO and, and they were signing other contracts with other companies. So this is a very resilient industry. This is really the wide west because there is no mechanism so far to protect the citizens. And, uh, and there is a lot of embarrassment from all governments to talk really about that because there is a yeah, there is um there is a use a global use of that, that kind of spyware all around the world that is really not regulated. And this is exactly the point where it is uh, disturbing uh, in uh, um, in which extent uh, member states, governments uh, in the European Union and the European Commission is not uh, taking uh, any measures or even a stand on on uh, how they see this. And this, uh, Hannah, you mentioned also in in your speech in the European Parliament, this kind of a cartel of silence. You you said so. You mentioned it before. How uh, how can it be that governments really sh can shy away from this without being like pressured also from inside or from parliaments? Is there um, just too less awareness also uh, by national parliamentarians or how do you exchange also with your counterparts on a national level? There is indeed this cartel of silence that we are facing but it's not just us who are facing it. I mean, it's the journalists who try to investigate who are facing it. And it's our colleagues in national parliaments where frankly said, I find it even more striking um, because the uh, carte blanche of national security shouldn't work there. Um, or if it also works there, then there is really no trust that there could be any kind of control there. And Frank said, this is where we are at the moment. So in Greece, for example, there has been an inquiry committee, but the final report has been basically totally blackened out. 
In Spain, on national level, they stopped the inquiry committees or the Catalans have one. In, in their regional assembly, they have one. In Poland and Hungary, basically, the authorities uh, totally refuse to cooperate. In the national context, we have the problem that often it's this usual reflex of government against opposition that also plays out in parliament and in inquiry committees. So the government who is part of this misuse is uh, intentionally or unintentionally by allowing it, but in most of the cases intentionally, of course, wants to block every kind of proper investigation. The opposition often also victim of the abuse um, wants to investigate, but they are not given the information. When it comes to the European Parliament, we, and this is maybe one of the biggest achievements of our inquiry committee, managed to overcome this dynamic somehow, because we have people from political parties who are at the same time victim and offender. So for example, the social democrats in Greece are victim from the misuse of spyware. In Spain, they are actually the offender. The conservatives are victims in Poland and to some degree in Hungary, whereas in Greece, they are offenders. And this, this was a very challenging and tough discussion that we also had in negotiations because I'm the shadow for the Greens, so I sit in all these negotiations where basically at one point we had to tell all these political parties, you cannot say that it, what Citizens Lab and journalists have uncovered in one country is a fact, and in the other countries it's pure lies and speculation. And I'm quite confident, at least that's where we are in the negotiations right now, that in the end we will agree that it's facts everywhere, and that is a step forward. But indeed, we see in the national context everyone's trying to put a lid on it, and frustratingly, even if they are spied upon themselves, because that's what we see in France, Laurent mentioned that, but we had the same thing in Spain, and that was maybe the most cumbersome moment, when we were in the parliament just looking into Catalan Gate, where the Spanish government was misusing spyware on Catalan independence politicians, activists, journalists, and at the same time had to find out that they are being spied upon, most likely by the Moroccan, which clearly shows if there is the vulnerabilities out there, no one is safe. And that counts for the politicians, but it also counts for the journalists. And um, referring back also to this day of uh, press freedom today uh, and, and going back to, to Tassos, I mean, it's kind of a little bit disturbing also that um, there is not such of a large scale media outcry uh, in like uh, mainstream, so mainstream is not maybe the, the, the best word, but like in the most important media channels uh, across uh, Europe. How, how do you think this um, is happening? Because uh, having heard from what, what Hannah just said, this counts for journalists in the same way. If uh, uh, if one is unsafe in this regard, it could meet uh, uh, and hit everybody, isn't it? Oh, unfortunately, we're not able to hear you right now. I don't know if you have to unmute you technically. No, it's muted. Not sure what the reason is. Might, might be connected with your microphone, or uh, as you might be in a different channel, but I don't think so. Um, so maybe Tassos, you're you're just trying to check the reason that we can't hear you right now, and I'm I'm inviting Laurent to maybe also uh, a comment on on this question. Yeah, sorry, can you say again your question? Uh, yeah, sorry, it, it was like referring to the question uh, that uh, what happens to, to politicians on the one side that uh, if one can be spied on, of course, the others can't be secure anymore. This counts for journalists in the same yeah. way. And I'm, uh, I'm just also a little bit surprised that uh, the awareness in, in media uh, mm -hmm. uh, outlets is not so high either. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
it's 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 true that we when we were doing the Pegasus when we were coordinating the Pegasus project, we learned a lot about how to coordinate this large investigative uh, project uh, with um, um, with a lot of companies and uh, with a, with a lot of states and a company in front of us who were using spyware to to spy mm -hmm. on journalists. So we didn't want to be the next one on the list. So we have to, we had to learn about how to do that, how to communicate safely, what kind of platform we can use, what kind of application. We were very advised with um, by Amnesty International Security Lab on that. And it's true, as you say, that the most of the journalists, investigative journalists, were using Signal, for instance. It's an encrypted application. Um, as as WhatsApp actually, except that WhatsApp is owned by Facebook and and Signal is um, is um, is an open source uh, technology. Um, but the thing is, even if you are using uh, an encrypted um, application, once you once you are infected, you are really trapped. So the, the the spyware is inside your device, so can read what you are reading, whether it's encrypted or not. Um, so, so the level of knowledge on the journalistic side, on the political side, is really, we, um, we, I think we have to consider that nothing is really safe. That's the first uh, lesson to, to 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 get from that. That uh, if someone is telling you that this application is entirely safe, you should not trust that person because one day you will learn that this application has been hacked by someone. The thing is, is how. Is is we are in front. We have in front of us an industry with people who are able to sell what we call a zero day. A zero day is a vulnerability that you just discover. You are the first to discover, and you are discovering a vulnerability to get into uh, mm -hmm. uh, your iPhone through TikTok or through WhatsApp or through uh, iMessage or uh, one kind of application. And if you are able to find to discover that vulnerability. Uh, you can resell or sell that to a broker or to a company like NSO. You can sell that for one million. So you can change your life entirely if you are able to find one, one kind of uh, vulnerability like that because in front of you, people are ready to pay for that. Dictators are ready to pay millions to just to target one citizen. So, so this is why we need regulation for that kind of market. Otherwise, as Edward Snowden say on the very same day of the regulation, today we're just talking about 50,000 phone numbers. But we, if we are doing nothing to control that, we will be having 50 million of phone numbers in two years from now. So yes, the knowledge of journalists on uh, on the polit political ecosystem on many in many parts of our civil society is 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 not very high but in the meantime what to do the the uh we we just have to to i think it's it's it would be much more efficient to to build regulation and laws to protect the citizens and then to train billions of people on the planet about how to use this uh, this application to stay under the radar mm. Thank you. So referring back to Tassos, how, how do you look at, at this issue of also the awareness in, in broader media um, uh, uh, on the issue? Oh, unfortunately, it's still not working. <laughs> I don't know what, what, the, what the issue is. I guess it's somehow linked to your microphone, maybe. Um, Okay, maybe I'm using this for another question to Laurent, which is linked to a question by someone um, following uh, us here. Um, there was a question, to what extent are the cases of the uh, Pegasus spyware being used against the investigative media outlet El Faro in El Salvador under investigation? Um, I don't know if you can say anything about that, but it just came up by someone in the audience. No, I can't. I can't say about, more about that. I know that. Uh, so there is. Um, we we know about those cases in Salvador of, thanks to the notification of Apple. Actually, if I'm right. So so this is so one kind of consequences of um, of uh, Apple notification to notify victims and to and for uh, and for um, organization like Citizen Lab or Amnesty International were really part of that process now when people get notified 
the two organizations uh, during the forensic of that. And, and, and just to say something as well, what is very interesting and uh, in, 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 in all the, the case about Pegasus is that when we were doing the Pegasus project, so in partnership with Amnesty International Security Lab, Amnesty did take a very strong decision in releasing uh, the, the, the toolkit to allow people to do their own forensic. So they were, uh, for years, they were uh, getting a lot more and more knowledge about the, 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 the infection and, and how the, the processes and how to find evidences of that. And I think this project was uh, very strong and powerful as well, because we were not only um, talking about the list, but we were putting evidences on the table with, uh, with the forensic evidences. And, and, and uh, Claudio Garnieri and Don Cao Carol were the two key person in, within Amnesty Tech who were doing all the forensic during this investigation. I've been able to de decide to, at the end of the project to make it available for all citizens of the world. If you want to know if you are infected by Pegasus, you can uh, try, uh, you can download this code and, and do your own forensic uh, analysis on your phone. And by doing that, they were uh, aware, of course, that NSO will be immediately change their own strategy to infect uh, in the future uh, other victims. But in the meantime, by doing that, we were able to discover many other uh, victims all around the world. So that was really a key decision. Perfect. Thank you. Tassos, can we uh, have another check? Can you hear me? Now? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So, so uh, we invite you to to come back into uh, uh, commenting on on how the situation for journalists uh, plays out, and and why is what in 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 your view is there so uh, uh, a low awareness also for the bigger media in Europe on the uh, case you revealed in Greece? Well, uh, I think that the main problem is that. Uh, this kind of story has a very strong technical aspect. I remember me talking to, to a lot of colleagues from bigger media in places of Europe that are not suspect of having the record of press freedom that Greece has. And uh, they wanted us to come to a conclusion just jumping into it. And I try to explain to them, you need a very long run to win this race. And nobody is willing to take this long run. And I'm speaking about media that are very rich, that have a lot of resources, and even those people do not have the concentration to, 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 to go into this run. So one of the problems is the structure of media, the structure of news. Uh, the story uh, is, let's say, uh, at least double-edged. That means these companies are very clever uh, to, to let you all the time two ways in front of you, to let, let you doubt, doubting that it may be the other way also. Uh, I, have I have been confronted with that all the last 18 months we're working with that story. Is it that? Or it may be that. But this is the very essence of journalism, isn't it? So Absolutely. Uh, I, I think we have forgotten in working this way. And I, find, I found this story a very intellectually challenging way of remembering what is the essence of our job. So mm. if you ask me, not the people are responsible, we are responsible. Uh, we are not working not hard enough to go this way. And the opponents we have vis-a-vis -vis us are cleverer than we do. Which is, which is the place they produce the spyware? I want to go to some remark that Hannah made. If I, made, if I write the whole, the whole codes uh, in Northern Macedonia and I leave two, two lines, uh, 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 in the in the program that I haven't written, I haven't finished the product. Then it's a semi-finished pro product. Then if it goes to Greece, 
from Northern Macedonia, it doesn't need an export license because it's not a product. Do you get me? Mm. And I can write a, a line in Greece and it, it's, it's not a product yet because one line misses. Then this goes to Cyprus. It's European Union. It doesn't need any license anyway. And from Cyprus, it can be exported to some place. So where is product being created? Hmm. It goes all the time like this. It goes all the time like this. And the regulatory ABC we have learned in Europe and the journalism we have learned in Europe are not capable enough to catch that. One of the questions coming up from the audience, which I'd like to uh, give back to you, Tassos, also is um, uh, you have been spied on. So and, and you say it's so hard to, of course, also prove uh, those things. And, and there is um, a weak position very often. So what can you do if you suspect that you are spied on uh, just as a practical question in the end to you? To, to whom could you go if you have those suspicions? What, what, what's your advice also? Amnesty and citizen are two things that you should miss. Uh, of course, if you have an Android, it's much more difficult, like Laurent may, may know, vis-a-vis uh, -vis an, an uh, uh, phone that runs with iOS. Uh, uh, iOS it's much much easier traceable for various reasons. I don't want to go now the, into technicalities. I possess an Android, so this may, may make me an easier target. But even then, you have to test your phone all the time. You have to update your phone all the time. You have, have to switch off your phone every day. Uh, people People who are living with their phones all time on are easier targets. So, uh, uh, and you have to go to, to many places like we did in the last year without your phone. Thank you for that, that, the, yeah, sorry. That, that thing, this, this, this is the most tension. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the uh, short advice. Uh, I think there is a lot more to find uh, uh, also with those people working with you. And you referred, I think, to Amnesty Tech uh, and um, uh, to the Citizens uh, Lab. Uh, so uh, maybe those who uh, are interested could find more information there. Maybe if uh, I may ask like a final question to, to Hannah and the way ahead in the European Parliament is really something we are looking on now when you are voting on the final report of the PEGA committee next week and then in the next plenary of the European Parliament. And we all wait for the European Commission and the member states to answer this clear call, hopefully by the European Parliament. Um, Uh, what do you think is the most important uh, like request and demands we have to raise vis-a-vis uh, -vis especially the uh, national governments uh, with their respective uh, work uh, and, and frameworks for national security where these techniques are uh, used and, uh, and how uh, can, this, can this be brought forward uh, after the European Parliament has uh, produced this work? Maybe I answer on, on three levels, starting from the victims. So people like Tassos. Um, it is crucial that people like Tassos can go to an entity, have their phones checked, a verified EU entity. And if this entity says you're being spied upon, this can be used for court cases. And if a state spies on, on victims, they need to come clear, explain why they do that, what they use the information for. So everything goes back into kind of a rule of law process where it is not at the moment. Then we have to come up and our report does that with very clear guidelines and benchmarks that clearly limit the use of spyware, that limit the functionalities. So for example, spyware that can modify content on your phone has to be banned. 
for example, spyware that goes back behind the date of where yeah, actually is the warrant has to be banned. So we need to limit this, we need to limit the group of people on which it can be used, and we need to clearly spell out what the legal safeguards have to be for proper use. And if member, st member states have to report, and this is what they have to accept, it's fundamental right, so the European Union has a role in that. So the European Union can check if all these prerequisites are done, and they can forbid member states to use spyware if they are not done, and the, the European level has to continuously check that. That's the second level. And the third one for me is clearly transparency. Um, as Laurent said, this thing is a weapon. And when it comes to, well, using weapon and exporting weapon, we have, for example, transparency guidelines saying um, what is exported, for what purpose, to whom, who can it be used against, and we need that for spyware. We have something in Germany, it's happening internally, that county, because it's the county level in Germany that decides on the use of spyware, they have to report to the national level how often do they use spyware against what kind of victims, for what purposes, for how long. And we kind of need the same kind of reporting on the European level. So also we can see if one member state basically goes rogue. And before you cut me over, let me allow me to do a little promotion because we did something in the course of this project. Um, you can find it under spywarefiles.eu where we tracked all the revelations around the misuse of spyware, either when there's confirmed misuse and victims or confirmed abuse of export licenses to clearly show how systemic the abuse is globally. So it builds on the work of people like Laurent and Tassos, but it basically includes all the revelations. So if you want to get a full picture and then more details on individual cases, you can go there. Lots of journalists in there. You can also just um, Google, but basically search for journalists. Thank you very much, Hannah. And uh, once again, thank you to uh, our three guests uh, we had today. Uh, Laurent Richard, the founder and uh, yeah, uh, CEO of Forbidden Stories, uh, so to say, uh, Hannah Neumann, a member of the European Parliament, they're in the PEGA, PEGA uh, Inquiry Committee, and Tassos Telu. Uh, to Loglu, an in investigative journalist uh, in Greece, and uh, all of you, uh, thank you for your work and for uh, being with us this hour uh, today on the International Day of Press Freedom. Uh, and thank you for all who followed this uh, event today for listening. Vielen Dank fürs dabei sein, fürs Zuhören und in ein, einen guten Tag der Pressefreiheit. Und uh, wir alle schauen auf den weiteren Prozess, wie diese Ereignisse aufgearbeitet werden und vor allen Dingen, welche Konsequenzen daraus für die Zukunft gezogen werden. Hoffentlich demnächst dann auch von der EU-Kommission und den Mitgliedstaaten im Lichte des Beschlusses uh, des Abschlussberichts des Untersuchungsausschusses. Ausschusses im Europäischen Parlament. Äh, dazu wird es in der kommenden Woche und dann in der nächsten Plenarsitzung des Europäischen Parlaments neue Erkenntnisse und äh, Nachrichten geben. Äh, bleiben Sie dabei, bleibt alle dabei und äh, bis zur nächsten Gelegenheit zu diesem Thema auch an unsere teilnehmenden Gäste von heute. Herzlichen Dank, einen schönen Abend. Thank you, Jan and everyone. Goodbye. Thank you, bye.